In this interview series from the CQF Institute, we ask leading quants to reflect on their careers, the skills needed for quantitative finance, and to offer their views on the latest industry developments. What do you think are the most important future skills aspiring quants should acquire? My answer is actually perhaps somewhat surprising, but I think actually the most surprising skill, right? It's not you know, your, your mathematical skill, your program skill, obviously those things are important and they're not must have. But I think actually the ability to ask interesting questions and also then thinking about how to solve them, right? Because if you think about it, um, you know, how do you really make an impact in this industry is actually solve, you know, basically coming out with a new approach and um, doing something that's different than what other people are doing, right? In order to have that, you need to ask, interesting question. By interesting, I mean, you know, both original and also uh, impactful, right? And something um, something that's uh, that's very applicable. So, so the ability to really ask interesting questions and then figure out a way to solve them, whether you want to use the latest technique. So today that would probably be machine learning and natural language processing, where you want to use some more traditional approaches, such as, you know, linear regression, where even, you know, in the future, something that um, something that's, you know, that hasn't you know been popularized or invented yet. I think uh, the methodology changes, um, but the, the, that core ability to ask relevant and pertinent questions should will always stay the same. And I think that's actually the most important. I think also that's what distinguishes between a uh, run the mill quant versus somebody who I think is really good. Because at the end of the day, right, quant industry is very competitive and there are a lot of people with the requisite skill. But I think what's really distinguishing the people who are just kind of okay and doing okay versus somebody who is really making an impact is that characteristic and that capability. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself when you first started your career as a quant? So when I was a quant, right, actually I got into quant kind of by accident, you know, and I'll, and I'll tell you what I did. Um, you know, I was always very interested in math. I guess that's pretty typical, right? And I did a, I did a PhD in sort of mathematical sciences. And, and then, uh, you know, as I was graduating, there were really two career options open academia or, or, you know, uh, at that time, Wall Street, um, and Wall Street just seems much more interesting to me. So I got in, I was a fixed income desk quant, right? So, you know, building HAM, you know, risk neutral models, et cetera. And I was reading a lot of established theory and, you know, trying to do what other people to do, but. First thing that I did actually at Morgan Stanley, when I, which was my first job that was somewhat worthwhile, was that when I joined, I started doing working on a problem that nobody else was doing, right? It was kind of like a little kind of not interesting problem, uh, but it was something that was new that kind of got me noticed, right? So I got promoted to be a trader. So I think, you know, um, and then later on, I moved on to uh, BlackRock again, you know, I joined Quant equity team and you know at the time a lot of there was a lot of accounting based research right so accrual you know accounting quality uh financial statement type of information and there were a lot of professors there and i you know i was trying to really learn what they were doing but i realized one thing is like you know well actually i'm never going to be as good as they are doing what they do they have you know decades of experience and you know they're building the 25th version of accounting quality signal, right? The world do not need 26th version coming from me, definitely, right? So I did something a little bit different. And I did, what I did was, um, you know, previously I was at Google actually, uh, right before BlackRock. And at Google, it was quite an interesting experience. Um, they, they were really treating their employees very well, you know, the massages and the free food and all that stuff. And, you know, this was 10 years ago. So it's still somewhat original. I guess a lot of companies are doing that now. but uh, I, and I thought about it and it made a lot of sense to treat your employee well because your employee really are, you know, they're very, they're really your competitive advantage, right? Especially for a software company or a financial company, you know, IP, intellectual capital heavy companies. So it makes sense to treat your employee well. So using that insight, right? I started looking, thought about, well, can I actually, you know, do something that can, you know, measure whether companies employee are being treated well or, you know, they're happy or they're motivated or they're just, you know, disgruntled, right? So the first thing I came up with at, at BlackRock uh, as a as a quant equity uh, person was actually this what's now called the glass door or employee sentiment signal. And you know, again, 
kind of commonplace these days, but 10 years ago, that was kind of new and interesting, right? When we, we found this data store, you know, nobody was really thinking about using at the time called um, called Glassdoor. Actually, I remember when we were calling Glassdoor, they said, why would you want to use us? I said, I don't know, be interesting. Said, okay, here's data for free. Just take it, right? So I think what I would tell myself 10 years ago when I just starting, and I would tell all the people now is that try to be original, try to do something different. You know, you can follow, obviously know the established theory and all that stuff, right? But it's very hard to come up with something completely new in the field that everybody's been trying to, trying to, you know, work in for the last 20 years. You might as well go do something different or orthogonal. Um, I think that is, that is both interesting and also make yourself uh, noticeable among, amongst the crowd because there is a crowd, right? So I think, I, I think that would be, that would be the advice I would give to my younger self. What has been your biggest challenge in your career? So I think the biggest challenge in my career uh, actually happened quite early in my career. Um, so in that sense, I was very lucky. I think it's good to fail early because um, then you probably have a more chance to pick yourself back up. Um, so, you know, I, I started uh, the previous question I mentioned that I started my career as a cell site quant, right, at Morgan Stanley after a PhD. And um, I relatively quickly got promoted into trading. I was trading, you know, a fairly complicated fixed income instrument. And life was great, right? You know, um, the more complicated you are, the more margin you can charge, right? You know, basically. So it was, uh, you know, the fees were, were well, the, 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 the profit was good. And, um, but you know what? Overnight, the world changed. It was 2008. Right, so I started being a. I joined Morgan Stanley in 2005. I became a trader in 2007, early 2007, late 2006, and then um, I had about a year and a half of good time, and then the world changed. Uh, all of a sudden, exotic derivatives went from um, being the hottest thing on in on, on the street to nobody wants to touch it. People just want flow and vanilla instrument, right? Uh, so that was the the biggest challenge, and I think one takeaway for me is that um, you can never rest on your laurels. You really just cannot. The world changes very quickly. And so you just have to keep on being fresh. And I, you know, the thing, one thing I really saw is that I saw a lot of very high flying traders. And if you recall pre-crisis, traders were making a lot of money, really a lot of money, right? If you think about it. And um, I see a lot of these highly skilled traders, overnight their job become obsolete. And um, some adapt and some didn't. Right. And, you know, what, what ended up happening is that, um, that, that, you know, for some people, it just became really hard. It was very hard for me, you know, and it took me actually quite, quite a couple of years to, 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 re, to find my footing again, to, to be honest with you and to retool myself, you know, to become a more of a buy side uh, quant. Right. Um, so a few takeaways. One is that, um, the world changes quickly. So you need to keep on keeping yourself fresh, always know the latest stuff, right? And two, you know, never let success go into your head. A lot of the times, you don't know if it's you or it's the seat. I'll be honest with you, right? A lot of people sitting in that seat can make a lot of money. But, you know, if you no longer occupy that seat or the condition of such that that seat no longer exists, do you really make that much money? So don't let success go to your head. And um, and and, and number, number three thing is that, uh, you know, if you have a solid foundation, uh, if you have a solid educational foundation, you should be able to reapply yourself to find something different. So, you know, going from buy side to sell side was actually quite a leap. But, you know, luckily I, I received a very solid, um, you know, mathematical education. And, um, you know, I guess I'm smart enough so that I was able to, you know, make the transition and pick up new, new tools. So, so these are a couple of takeaways, but the early, yeah, this, these are some, it, it, it was a, it was a period of time that was really deeply imprinted in my mind. Um, the 2008 great financial crisis, the global financial crisis. And in, in a sense, I hope I never, I hope I still remember the lessons from all those years ago. 